front. Well, get your Bible, and um, let's go to the book of Hebrews. We are going verse by verse through the book of Hebrews, and uh, tonight we're in chapter number 10. Now, I'm not sure. Next Wednesday night, we may take a detour. Uh, I know I hate to skip Hebrews for too many weeks because we've had a lot of... uh, different changes in schedule anyway, but next Wednesday night, we might do a message on Wednesday night about Holy Week, and uh, because next Wednesday, of course, is the beginning of all the events that lead up to the crucifixion, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, do you uh, realize that Easter is right around the corner? I mean, it's, it's right there. It's, it's just coming really, really fast. And on Easter Sunday, uh, what is that, the 31st, is it? On Sunday the 31st, we have a little bit of change in the schedule. Do you remember? Service time is at 8 and 10. Normally, it's 8.30 and 10.30, but we're doing 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock, and we've got breakfast in the middle there. We're going to start serving breakfast about 9.15, maybe 9.30, and uh, we'll serve the people that get out of the early service as well as the people that come in for the second service. So make your plans to join us. We'll be serving outside under the port cachet also flowing out into the uh, fellowship hall. We're believing the Lord for a beautiful morning that morning. Last Easter, how many remember, it rained. I, I mean, we had a... We we had a sunrise service planned, and we were out by the back 40 of the property at 7 o'clock, and the heavens opened up. I, I mean, it just poured. And uh, we were out there for about three or four minutes, and we were praying, it's going to pass, it's going to pass. And all of a sudden, it just opened up. So we had a little bit of a scramble last year. We were going to have breakfast outside. We had to scramble and take it inside. So this year, we're praying for a great, great, uh, beautiful day. Now, I've been mentioning to a couple of people, if you normally attend the 1030 service for Easter Sunday, I would like you to consider going to the early service because we expect to be packed on on Easter, particularly at that 10 o'clock Sunday and a lot of guests, a lot of visitors. And so if you normally come at that second service, you might want to consider the first service, and we'll open up and have more room for, for guests and, and people that come in for the special day. Both services are the same. If you've attended the 830 service on a regular basis, you know it's the same praise and worship. It's the same message. It's the same anointing. Everything is the same. Yes, there are generally more people in the 1030 service than there are in the 830 service, but it's the same Jesus It's the same anointing. It's the same experience. So for Easter, you might want to attend the 8 o'clock, and that way it'll kind of balance everything out a little bit. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, Tonight we're talking about the fact that Christ's sacrifice was once for all. Say that with me. Once for all. Now, we have been talking all the way through the book of Hebrews about better things. There's a better sacrifice. The blood of Jesus is better than all the blood of the animals that was spilled all those years coming up to the blood of Christ. The new covenant is better than the old covenant. The apostle Jesus is greater than the apostle Moses. Remember in the very first chapter, we started this alliteration. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the priests. Aaron, the high priest that served as Moses' priest, was his son, his, his brother, but he served as high priest in Israel. Jesus is not just the high priest. He is our great high priest. Everything about Jesus, the book of Hebrews, is better, better, better. Jesus is better. Now, the writer to the Hebrews, which if you've not been with us from the very beginning, I've kind of taken my uh, line in the sand on this. I've kind of drawn the, the line. I personally don't believe that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Some do. And when they get to heaven, they'll find out that I was right. No, I'm teasing. But uh, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, the whole point of the book is to tell the people, stop looking backwards and start looking forward. Stop looking in the past. Stop looking in the Old Testament. Stop looking in the Old Covenant. Stop depending upon the sacrifices and the rituals and the, and the, and the earthly 
priesthood and the uh, temple sacrifices, but start focusing on what is ahead because there's a new covenant. There's a better covenant. The blood of Jesus is more uh, sufficient than all the blood of the animals. And uh, if you remember a week or two ago, well, a chapter or two ago, which has been a month or two ago now because we've had special services on Wednesday nights and haven't been doing Hebrews every week, we, we discovered that the word says that that which is old is aging and will soon disappear. And little did they know, the writer to the Hebrews, when he wrote that, that's in chapter 8, in only a few short years. Most scholars date the book of Hebrews in 60 A.D. or so, 65 A.D. In 70 A.D. is when the Romans came in and completely destroyed the temple. They completely uh, raised the whole city of Jerusalem to rubble. And when that happened, temple sacrifices stopped. Uh, there have not been any temple sacrifices in Israel for over 2,000 years because there's no temple to sacrifice in. Now, the Samaritans, when I was in Israel a year or so ago, we went up to a mountain in Samaria, and they do still offer sacrifices on the Samaritan mountain, but it's not in Jerusalem because, and the Samaritans always kind of had their own uh, little kind of segue off of Judaism. They, they were like half-breeds, and, and they kind of did everything their own way. But in Jerusalem, there have not been temple sacrifices for these thousands of years because there's not been a temple that's been there to sacrifice in. That's why a lot of people turn their attention to the future, and in the book of Revelation, it's clear that the temple is eventually going to be rebuilt because temple sacrifices will be resumed. And it is in the temple that Antichrist will desecrate the house of God. He'll put an end to temple sacrifices. So if the writer to the Revelation says that Antichrist is going to put an end to sacrifices, that means they have to be resumed so that he can put an end to them. So we don't know that when that's going to happen. It, it doesn't have to happen prior to the next event on God's calendar. If, uh, if the rapture still took place today, there would be plenty of time between now and the midpoint of tribulation when the temple sacrifices could be reinstituted and then Antichrist could desecrate the temple. But in the recent weeks, like chapter 9, we went all through the blood of Jesus that it was greater than the blood of the animals and it was offered in the heavenly sanctuary which is in the presence of God not in the earthly sanctuary which was the temple or the tabernacle so today we're going to pick up this theme the blood of Jesus his sacrifice was once for all aren't you thankful one time forever not to be repeated, never having to be done over again. And I don't mean to be mean-spirited, but there is a Christian segment of religion that has a certain type of ceremony in their ritual, which in their worship, they are actually re-sacrificing the blood of Jesus. I don't know if you know that. The Catholic Mass is actually a re-sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. When we have communion service, we are not re-sacrificing the blood of Jesus. We are not doing it over again because the book of Hebrews says it's been done once for all. What the apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, this do in remembrance of me. We're not sacrificing the blood of Jesus. We're remembering that the blood of Jesus was sacrificed once for all to take away the sins of the world. So let's read of these 18 verses and then we'll break them down and we'll walk through them. For since Hebrews chapter 10, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of the realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Now we'll get back to that. Otherwise would they have not ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices there is a remind reminder of sins every year for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin 
Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Now this section, if you have a Bible that is phrased that way, you'll see it's, it's it indented and it's centered, which let us know it's poetic language, and this is actually a quote. This is a quote from the Old Testament. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written in me of the scroll of the book. And when he said above, you had neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ. What's it say? Once for all. And every priest stands daily in service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies shall be made a footstool for his feet. For a single offering, he has purified for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, when I put my law in their hearts and write them in their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Now, I know... uh, is that Jessica? She'd been tracking with me as I was reading all that. So now we're going to roll it back to the beginning, and we're going to go through these verses, and we're going to break them down, and we're going to outline it. If you've heard me teach, and if you're here on these Wednesday nights on a regular basis, you know that I take very seriously that passage that says, A workman, let us study to show ourselves approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And then what's the next part of that verse? Rightly dividing the word of truth. I have learned, and in my opinion, one of the best ways to understand the Bible is to outline it. To, to know that there are divisions and sections and chapters and, and, and paragraphs. And to be able to structure it where, where you can see there is a logical sequence of information that the Bible writers are putting together. How many know all Scripture is given in the inspiration of God? It's not random. God just does not throw the word out there. Words are important to God. I said words are important to God. That's why he took his son and he sent him to earth and he called him the word. So when God uses words in the Bible, they're very carefully chosen. They're very uh, supernaturally structured and, and ordered to teach us truth. And the Bible is a book. That God wants us to understand. It's not just a collection of of, uh, religious or or inspirational sayings. It's a book that God wants us to understand. So the first thing is, is number one, the failure of the old sacrifices. Uh, Let's reread verse uh, one or so. Uh, What's it say? For since the law has but a shadow... Of the good things to come instead of the true form of the realities. It can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. The Old Testament sacrifices, number one, letter A, they could not bring access to God. Mankind has always longed to have access into the presence of God. Always long to be with God. Always wanted to have an audience with the king. Always wanted to be drawn near to the presence of God. But all of the Old Testament sacrifices repeated over and over and over every year with repetition. It says right here, they could not um, make um, the sacrifices that are continuing to make perfect those who draw near because they were only shadows. And we've talked in the past about the shadow versus the reality. We've talked about the word types or pictures versus the the, uh, true um, reality. And shadows can only reflect 
They can only picture things. Uh, the word shadow, this was interesting to me. I was studying on this today. It says this shadow refers specifically to a pale shadow, something that is not clear, something that is um, not very vivid, and, and that's in contrast to a sharp, distinct picture. And when I was thinking about this, uh, I started thinking, because I'm a technology guy, I, I, I started thinking about high-definition television sets. How many have an HD TV? Uh, uh, probably everybody. How many have probably four or five of them in your house? How many have 4K TVs? You know what all that means? That means there is more distinction on the screen. There are more pixels. 4, 4K, 4,000 dots on your screen, 4,000 pixels make up that image. Uh, a year or so ago, uh, through uh, Jared's business, we were able to buy this new projector. How many remember the old projector we had? That it wasn't very bright, and you had to squint, and uh, if people were, couldn't read the, the screen, you know what I always told them the problem was? If you can't read the screen, you know what the problem is? You're sitting too far back. That's what the problem is. But uh, now this is an HD, high definition. This is not 4K. It wouldn't need to be 4K, but it's very clear. But how could we can remember? I, I remember uh, Pastor Cesar watching Michael Jordan films. I mean, Jared and I were huge Michael Jordan fans in the 80s. And now I see those replayed tapes, and I'm thinking, that's out of focus, man. I can't even see hardly what's going on because that was what? Um, yeah, it was analog, but it was 360 lines of uh, resolution on your TV screen, and it was analog, and it just wasn't clear. It just wasn't distinct. Now we got 4K HD TVs. When you watch the sports on TV now, you can see every... I mean, they throw those, those fast-pitch uh, baseballs. You can, you can see the seams on the baseball as it's coming towards the, towards the uh, camera. It's amazing. Now, that's what the writer to the Hebrews, to give you that analogy, that's what he's saying. The old system, the Old Testament, it was just a shadow. It was, it was an analog picture. It was blurry. It wasn't vivid. It was hard to really see what was going on. But now it has been replaced with something that is the very form. It is the exact replica. It's, it's like a photograph that's in perfect, sharp, clear, detailed, vivid color. Now, one of the writers I was reading from today said this, which I don't know if I've ever really thought about this. He said, Judaism today, even today, you know, people that uh, still follow Judaism, people in Israel, people in New York City, Hasidic Jews, uh, they, they've never accepted Jesus as Messiah. They've rejected that, that Jesus was Messiah, and some of them are still following all the traditions of Judaism. He said this, Judaism today is even still without many of the shadows. They have the scriptures, what we refer to as the Old Testament, and they continue to celebrate certain feast days, but they have no tabernacle, they have no temple, they have no priesthood, therefore they have no daily or yearly sacrifices. Yom Kippur is still observed, but without a high priest, without an altar, and without a sacrificial lamb. Because modern unbelieving Jews refuse to recognize the new covenant that God made with them, and even the old has lost most of its influence. I'd never thought about that, but that is so true. What a tragedy. Not, not only have people not embraced the new covenant, what they once had as the old covenant is, is not even now what it once was. It, it's a shadow. It's a, it's a, for, a, a poor uh, reflection of what it once was. And so it could never bring them access to God. Let's, let's go on up to, uh, to uh, the next one up there. Uh, it could not remove sin. Look at verses 2 and 3. Otherwise, they would have not had to cease to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. Let me ask you a question. If a Jew went to the temple on Yom Kippur, and he knew he had sin in his life, 
and he sacrificed his Passover lamb, did he walk away from that temple having his conscience cleansed? Did he, did he walk away feeling that his heart was changed? Did he walk away believing that his sin was forever separated from him as far as the east is from the west? No. He walked away feeling, well, you know, I hope it worked. I don't feel anything. I, I don't believe anything. But I hope that the Passover lamb, his blood, has at least made a a, a covering. It's at least made a, a temporary uh, place of um, hiding so that I can be covered. By, but he never had his conscience cleansed. He, he never had his guilt taken away. He, he never had his heart changed because it could never change the heart of man. It could never remove sin. Now, I know I've said this a, a, a time or two in the past, but when John the Baptist saw Jesus... Now, not the first time he saw him because they grew up together. They, they were like boyhood playmates. They were cousins. And, and they probably played with each other growing up. But when John the Baptist saw Jesus after his baptism, when he came into his assignment as Messiah, the first time that John saw him after that, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Yeah. You remember this quote? That does what? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Not one that covers, not one that forgives, not one that hides, not one that just causes the wrath of God to temporarily turn away from. No, but the Lamb of God that removes, that takes away the sin of the world. And I'm so excited that tonight, unlike this old system when they would go and offer a sacrifice and they would still walk away from the altar with the consciousness of sin when we come to the altar of God the Bible says his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we have crossed from death unto life I believe that when we get up from an old fashioned altar having repented of our sin there ought to be something on the inside that you know you are right with God you know that it is forgiven you know that it is covered your heart is clean. Your mind is open. The forgiveness that God has given you is, 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 is complete because you are freed from the guilt of sin. They were, now get this, they were ceremonially clean, but they were still uh, consciously um, guilty. But when we come to the altar of God, we get our conscience cleansed, and the ceremonies are not that important anyway. I'd rather have the reality. I'd rather have my conscience cleansed than know I just went through the ceremony. How about you? In fact, as far as I'm concerned, they can have the ceremony. They can have the ritual. They can have the tradition. They can have all of the trappings of the religion process. All I want to know is that I went down to an old-fashioned altar, and there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to the name of Jesus. And I got up from that place forgiven and cleansed by the mercy of God. So let's go on a little bit further. Thank you so much, Jessica. These Old Testament sacrifices were only external. Okay, look at, let's read verses 4, 5, and 6 again. For it is impossible... For the blood of goats and, and bulls to take away sin. It, it just covered sin. It, it just made a, a temporary appeasement over God's anger because of sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and burnt offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will of God. And this, as I said, this is a quote from the Old Testament where Jesus is referring to what the prophet said about him coming, not just to cover sin, but to literally take away sin because his sacrifice was not external. His sacrifice was internal. There was no, uh, let me just read this, there was no relationship between a person's sin and the animal's sacrifice. Get a hold of that. In fact, you've heard about the idea of a scapegoat. You know, they, they would take all their sins and they would symbolically transfer their sins onto the head of this goat 
and then they would send the goat out in the wilderness to wander until he died of exposure, and that was called a scapegoat. They would put all their... That's, you've heard that term, a scapegoat? That's where it comes from the Old Testament. They would, they would symbolically put all their sins on that animal and then send him out in the wilderness to wander as if to think he's going to take their sins as a scapegoat out into the wilderness. But there was no, there was no correlation between what went on in their lives and what was happening on that on that uh, on that animal? There was no no connection. It was just merely a symbol. It was merely external. But when our sin was placed on Jesus, He who knew no sin literally became sin for us. And uh, every sin, including every sickness, every disease, every infirmity ever known to man was literally placed upon Jesus Christ. So that when he went to the cross, here's your quote, Pastor Cesar, you better get ready for it. He did not die just for us, he died as us. He took our place because we're the ones that needed to die. We're the ones that deserve sin, but he took our place. He didn't just die for me. He died instead of me. He died as me. He took my place. And so the relationship was, it was my sin that was on Jesus. It was not external. It was internal. So the old sacrifices couldn't do all of that. So let's switch now to the effectiveness of the new sacrifice, the blood of Jesus. I've read these already, 5, 6, and 7. It does reflect God's eternal will. It was God's will that Jesus should suffer. It says in the book of Isaiah, it was God's will that Jesus would be the suffering servant. Let me just fact, let me turn over there and read this. We're getting close to to Good Friday. We're getting close to this season. And every time I I get into this season, I remember one of the mentors, one of the great Bible teachers that I said under years, he he would quote Isaiah 53 uh, almost every Sunday. It was just like one of his favorite verses. Who has believed and heard and this is ESV, but of course he always quoted it from the King James. Who has believed and and he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he took all up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him, uh, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that bought us peace and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he has taken away. And as for his generation, who is considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And we get all the way down to verse 10. It says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And to put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering, he shall see his offspring and prolong his days. And I could could read the whole chapter. But it was God's will, literally, that he would go to that place of suffering. That he would make that eternal sacrifice over the uh, broken law of God for our lives. God could have never been satisfied with the animal offerings. And he became less and less satisfied with them as they became a sham and a mockery. And uh, Jesus' supreme mission on earth was to do the will of the Father. And we see that over and over in the Gospels. I have come to do your will, O God. So the new system, the new sacrifice, it replaces the old system. We're up to verses 8 and 9. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he 
added, Behold, I have come to do your will. And he does away the first in order to establish the second. God takes away the first in order to establish the second. A few weeks ago when we were talking about that passage, I talked about a little earlier where the temple sacrifices stopped being offered. I made the statement, I think it had to be in God's plan that the temple was destroyed. I think it had to be that the uh, uh, Romans came in and leveled the city and the priests could no longer keep offering sacrifices because if God wouldn't have done that, what would have happened? The people would have continued to, to do that repetitiously. They would have continued to worship the form. They would have continued to just go through the ritual. And so God had to take away the first in order to establish the second. I preached a message one time years ago. It really touched my heart. It, it, it ministered me to so deeply and so greatly. Sometimes God has to take away things in our lives that we're used to and that we're accustomed to and that we're familiar with in order for him to give us something better. So sometimes if God takes away something from you, instead of angry, shaking your fist in the face of God and said, why did you take this from me? Why did you take this job from me? Why did you take this relationship with me? Why did you take this? Why did you take that? Maybe the answer is God took away the old so that he could give you the new. Maybe he took away that old job so he could give you a better job. Maybe he took you out of a bad relationship so that he could open you to a new relationship with someone else that was going to have a permanent relationship. So a lot of times we're shaking our fists in the face of God. We're saying, oh, God, I don't want to lose this. I don't want to take this away. In fact, we're, we're rebu- we're, sometimes we're like Peter. Remember where Peter said to the Lord, Jesus said, behold, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to say, and what Peter said, oh, no, Lord, no, 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 that's not going to happen. How many times have we been guilty of trying to correct the Lord? And uh, we're trying to stop God from doing things that he's doing in our best interest. So if God starts taking away from things, some things from you, don't whine and complain. And, 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 and I'll give you this. Don't, it's not always the devil that takes things away from you. you know, that's usually what we do as charismatics. We rebuke the devil. I rebuke you, devil, in the name. It probably wasn't the devil at all. Come on. It was probably God that was taking away the old so that he could give you the new. Because he knew you were so comfortable with the old. You were so familiar with the old that you wouldn't accept the new. So God has to take away that he might establish. I love that verse. That's a powerful verse. In addition to the teaching, that is a powerful, um, symbolic, inspirational verse. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. He had to take away the old system to establish the the new system. Now, what does the new system do? Letter C, verse 10. It sanctifies the believer. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, what's it mean to be sanctified? Made holy. Set apart. The word sanctified literally means set apart. And if you recall, uh, a few years ago, three or four years ago, we went verse by verse all the way through the book of Romans. And one of the most important things that we learned in the book of Romans is that sanctification is a two-part process. You have to be set apart from some things, and then you have to be set in agreement with some other things. So sanctification is not just God taking away things. It is that, but it's God giving you something else. Sanctification is when he sets you apart when, from what he doesn't want you to be connected to, but then he sets you in agreement with what he does want you to to be connected to. I think it was the Apostle Paul, wasn't it said, come out from among them and be separate unto me, says the Lord. There's two things in that verse. What is the first thing? Coming out from among them. Getting away from those things, the people, influences, sins, choices, entertainments, activities. Now, Pastor Cesar and I, we, we, we sometimes talk about this and laugh. We were both raised pretty old school. And uh, we were always, Miss Irene is in the same boat, and there's a lot of you that were. We were always taught what we didn't believe. 
Right, Joe? I mean, I was always taught what I don't believe. I was always taught we don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't chew, we don't run around with girls that do. You know, I, I was taught all this stuff we don't do, but I was never really taught what we do do. I was taught what I was separated from, but I was never really taught what I was dedicated to. It's a two-part thing. Come out from among them and be separate unto me, says the Lord. So that's sanctification, and that's what happens by the blood of Jesus. Sanctified by his blood, set apart, made holy, sanctified, made pure through and through. It's a position of sanctification. Remember all this? It's, we are positionally sanctified. The very second a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, instantaneously they are positionally sanctified. They are in a split second taken from that place of, of, sep, uh, of, of union with the world and separation from God, and they're instantaneously taken from separation from the world and in unity with God. Instantly, positionally. But then there is a process <laughs> that has to happen. And that process of sanctification is where God is continuously helping us become the person that God already knows that we are. God already knows that you're perfect. You know that? Amen. Turn to your spouse and say, God knows more than I do. <laughs> I, I said, God already knows that you're perfect. God already knows that you are without blemish. God already knows that you are being molded to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. Now, we don't know that yet. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul says to the Romans, recognize that you are dead to sin. I don't always feel dead to sin. I don't know why it's only me that's confessing here tonight. You guys are just sitting there letting me make all the confessions. I said, I don't always feel dead to sin. Sometimes I feel pretty alive to sin, but the Word of God declares that I'm dead to sin. So what do I do? I have to reckon it so. I have to determine it to be so. I have to come into agreement with what God said because He positionally made me free from sin. So then I've got to progressively move to where God has already positioned me so that my lifestyle comes into agreement with what I already been declared by the blood of Jesus, and it sanctifies us. Letter D, it removes sin. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Think of the futility. Think of the uh, frustration of, of doing something repetitively. I mean, habitually, over and over and over, knowing really in all reality that it wasn't really changing anything, that it wasn't really making a difference. It was soothing the conscience. It was fulfilling the ritual. It was completing the ceremony. But in all reality, nothing was changing. Uh, it's not here. It was probably earlier here in the notes, and I must have skipped over it. I'd have to go back over there. I'll try to remember the number. Somebody had, had calculated that on the day of Yom Kippur, that's the day of atonement, that's the day that the Passover lambs were, were shed, uh, uh, killed every day, every year. Every family in Egypt, in Israel, had to have their own Passover lamb. And so every family would take their own lamb to the temple. And uh, I don't want to miss my time here, but I just will take a little bit of a detour for a second. The tradition was that lamb was a family pet. It, it was not like livestock. It was not like some wild animal that lived out in the field and just happened to be owned by the family. It was a family pet. It was like 
a choice lamb. It was like one that had been brought into the house and the children had fed that lamb and, and played with that lamb and slept with that lamb. It was very personal and that's why it was a great sacrifice to take that lamb to the temple and sacrifice it because it wasn't like they were farmers and they had hundreds and thousands of them and just one more wouldn't matter. But this was the choice lamb that was a family pet that they had to sacrifice. And I'm trying to remember the number that I read earlier today. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was 300,000 on the day of Yom Kippur in prior to when the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., at the peak of the nation of Israel, one-third of a million, 300,000 animals would be killed every year on that day. In fact, on Mount Moriah, that's the temple mountain where the uh, temple and the altar was, there were um, creases and and channels or like like uh, ditches or gutters that had been carved into the uh, rock to, to take that blood that would it, this is it's an ugly picture it really is but if, if you think Good Friday is is a beautiful sight you need to be reminded that it's an ugly thing that the blood of Jesus had to be shed but that blood would be pouring off the temple mountain and uh, they say that there's still places where the rocks are permanently stained with the continual flowing of the blood of 300,000 animals every year. And, uh, but think of the futility of this. What I read, verse, uh, verse 12, verse 11. The priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So what's that a picture of, that Jesus sat down? Why? Because his work was finished. His task was completed. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. So I'm getting a little short on time, but let's at least give you all the points. Uh, the effectiveness of the new sacrifices, it removed sin, it destroyed his enemies, because we know now that uh, Jesus' enemies have been made a footstool. And we also know that if we're in Christ, the enemy is under our feet, and uh, greater is he that's in us. Uh, Jesus told the New Testament church, Behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over all the power of the devil, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And then letter F, uh, Jessica, is that the new sacrifice, it perfects the saints forever. Verse number uh, 14, For a single offering he has perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. That verse, look at that verse, verse 14. Let me read that one again. That ex, that's one verse that explains that process that I described to you a few minutes ago. A single offering has perfected, has, past tense. It's already happened. The single sacrifice of Jesus has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. You see, there's both tenses right in that verse. It happened once for all positionally, but now it is progressively happening on a process because I'm continually becoming the person that God has already declared me to be. And then uh, letter G, it fulfills the promise of a new covenant. And that where I won't reread these last several verses, but this is where it, it says that uh, the promise of the new covenant was, I will remember their sins no more. Verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. So the blood of Jesus, the whole point of tonight, was offered once for all to take away the sins of the world. And when we celebrate, when we commemorate, when we have communion Sunday... 
when we have Good Friday uh, recognitions. By the way, I would go ahead and encourage everyone that possibly can to come to our Good Friday service. We have a community-wide Good Friday service. It's on Friday morning, Good Friday morning, the 29th of, of March. It's at the YMCA right down on Mariner Boulevard, south of Spring Hill Drive. And uh, I, there are seven pastors that will all be given a five-minute message on the seven last words of Christ from the cross. I, I get to give one of those messages this year. Pastor Meredith gets to give one of those messages this year. Seven other, seven total pastors, five others from around the community. And uh, we'll have Immerse Ministries. Justin Bonnie Beal will there be there singing. And uh, it's a ministry of the Hernando Christian Ministerial Association. And it is always very, very moving. Uh, it's very, very significant. Um, it, it, it's different than our normal service. It's a, like a one-hour service. But I've never went to one of those services without walking away with a deep sense of the presence of God because we're recognizing the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So that's a week from this coming Friday. That's on the 29th. It's at 9 o'clock at, uh, at the YMCA. So what I started to say is every time we have communion... Every time we remember Good Friday, every time we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made, we're not repeating it. We're not having a mass. We're not re-sacrificing Jesus, but we're doing this to remember what Jesus did once for all, never to be repeated again. And by his blood, he takes away the sins of the world. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just uh, wrap up with a word of prayer here this evening. Father God, I, uh, I thank you that no matter who we are, where we've been, or what we've done, Lord, there's not one person in this room that is perfect. There's not one of us that is without sin. The, the writer uh, John in his epistle said, the one that says he is without sin, he's a liar. And the truth of God is not in him. Every one of us, Lord, we sin in thought, word, and deed. We sin in commission. We sin in omission. Lord, we, we are not perfect in any respect. But in your eyes, we are. Because you paid the eternal price of the blood of your son, Jesus, to be able to forever look at us <laughs> through those rose-colored glasses. And see us not as we really are, but to see us as your blood declares that we are. Made worthy by the blood of Jesus. And Lord, help us to ever foresee that picture. Because if we see your vision for us, we'll rise up to how you see us. If we see ourselves the way the devil sees us, we'll degrade ourselves down to that lower level. But if we see ourselves the way you see us, we will rise ourselves up to the position of purity and righteousness and holiness because we know that you have invested the blood of your Son upon our lives. So bless the people in these next few days, Lord, as we get closer to Easter Sunday and Good Friday. Help us to all spend significant time just commemorating and, and thinking and contemplating the great sacrifice that you made for us that changes us forever because of your mercy. So we love you tonight, Father. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. We'll see you Sunday, Palm Sunday. Uh, on Sunday, here's what I'm preaching on Palm Sunday. No, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to make you come.